Hello and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, a podcast that has 300,034, 974,000 listeners every fortnight. And how are you, Rob? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Uh, yeah, I, I'm keeping on, keeping on. Lots of learning and, and things to keep up with, with a new job, which, uh, despite being weird in the current circumstances, has been quite a good way to break up the monotony. I definitely don't lack for things to do. Um and of course, being me, not only have I started that and I'm busy with all my normal life on the internet uh, and I'm busy recording these podcasts, but also I launched another podcast. Uh, so if you want to listen to me reading out public domain books, check out audio-folio.com where you will find the first seven chapters of Journey to the Interior of the Earth, which is the better translation of Jules Verne's classic um, Journey to the Centre of the Earth. Uh, which, yeah, I've been reading and will continue to read throughout the next month and a bit. That sounds awesome. That's another way for our listeners to uh, hear your dulcet tones. Well, yes, I mean, I hope people enjoy it. Uh, the people I've been sharing bits here and there with seem to enjoy it. So hope if you, if you like the sound of my voice and you like famous sci-fi stories, hopefully this works for you. Um, I haven't got an advert for it yet. I'm just saying this up, up front that I've just launched it today, so... Well, I, I I look forward to listening to it. You know, I I need something to help me get to sleep tonight, so you know that'd be nice to uh, listen to. Yeah, our um uh the, the guy who's done all of our nice new updated artwork. Uh, I sent him a preview of the first chapter, and then he jokingly sent back that he and his girlfriend had <laughs> fallen asleep to it that <laughs> night. So, hey. Some, sometimes it's not bad to have a calming, relaxing, if somewhat soporific voice. You know. It's during during these times you just need something to chill out to, and it's probably the perfect remedy for that. I mean, what are headlines anymore? Everything is now the main story, and the main story is coronavirus. I'm afraid. So, if you were expecting anything different, apologies. Uh, Brexit has disappeared. Uh, it's been replaced by this. So, uh, I suppose we should just kind of go over the last two weeks. So, I think maybe the most important story that we kind of left you on a cliffhanger. I'm sure people have been able to go onto the BBC News website to get updates. But when we last left you, um, we had had the the information come in live on the show that uh, Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, had unfortunately been taken to hospital with the coronavirus. Uh, yeah, it kind of shocked everyone, that news. And I think it put it in perspective how uh, if you didn't think it was serious, then it certainly is serious now that it could affect a man in his mid 50s um who everybody else you know i think we'd had prince charles had also been affected with it and he kind of shrugged it off and people went oh it's a big fuss over nothing but yeah with um boris johnson having to be you know he was first taken into hospital and then into intensive care um it sounded like it was touch and go there for a second on his you know he left hospital um and did a very moving speech in which he praised the two nurses who'd stayed by his side um a jenny from new zealand and a lewis from portugal um which I thought was, you know, a, a great gesture by him. Also showed the way that, you know, immigrants and those people who are, you know, are not born in our country are so important to the running and functioning of our NHS, which seems almost counterintuitive to the messages Boris Johnson's Conservative Party or maybe, you know, the Brexit Party would have been throwing around in the election only a few months before. Um, so it's it, it, nice to see that softer side of Boris, um, and it's good that he pointed out the work of, um, you know, people who are you know, immigrants who are, uh, you know, working in the NHS. Uh, I thought it was also a bit poignant to point out that uh, one of the big effects of coronavirus it seems to be affecting BAME citizens disproportionately. Um, there are figures uh, that come in from the 17th of April that reveal of the 13,918 patients that are in hospitals in England who had tested positive for uh, COVID-19 at the time of death. 73.6% were of white ethnicity and 16.2% were of BMA, BAME ethnicity. Um, if you compare that to the 2011 census, um, where you have about 7.5% of the population were Asian, about 3.3% were black, there is this... Uh, you know, it seems to show that BME people are affected at a greater, you know, more by Corona than uh, white citizens. Uh, this is also borne out kind of like, it's more 
anecdotal, um, but if you take a very small subject, of very small subset of the victims of COVID-19, um, that being the frontline health workers, um, about I think we've had about 60 to 70 deaths and around 50 of those have been from BAME backgrounds. Um, now, you know, we don't know enough about the virus to see if, the, say, if this is a genetic reason. Um, but I think one of the big things that Corona does do is it shows some of the socio-economic divides that we have in our society. Um, and there are a couple of underlying factors that tend to put, you know, these these existing inequalities that will be more greatly exposed at a time of crisis. Um, so, for example, um, from a, a quote from one of the articles I pulled this from actually um so south asians live in more deprived areas in general and tend to have more diabetes kidneys and cardiovascular disease all which would be qualified as underlying health conditions which would put them at a larger risk um, of having a serious side effect when it comes to uh, covid19 um additionally um these workers may be living in you know larger multi-generational households um so social isolation social isolation isn't that easy um and on top of that because they're also they make up a lot of key worker jobs, which unfortunately tend to be the lowest paid, which because they're frontline, because you've got you know doctors and nurses on frontline wards, but also people who are just working you know in in supermarkets, for example. Um, then all of that combines to see why you're seeing a larger proportion of BMA citizens in intensive care compared to you know comparatively wealthier white citizens who have more living space, more, you know, option to work from home, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, so I think that, you know, I don't know if you've got anything to add on that, but it's just, it's amazing how something that affects everybody can really bring up a lot of the other fault lines in our society um, in that way. I think, um, so, so there's two things I want to mention. One, one, if you listen to the BBC's coronavirus podcast, their latest episode uh, as of yesterday did touch on this uh, and they had some guests on talking about it i think one of the i mean there's various issues you've mentioned but one of the things was apparently there was a rumor going around that uh you were immune to it if you were black on twitter and so maybe it's possible that some older uh people saw that and took that as fact instead of as uh, as a rumor um and and that may not have helped uh but uh, i mean listen to that episode for more information on that because it's not something i've had a chance to really read up on um, and the other thing I'd probably compare it with is, is the US, where they're seeing very similar trends. And I think I think we like to think we're not as bad at that kind of social inequality over here than in the US. And, and um, you know, we have things like the NHS and other uh, safety nets that aren't present in the US. But I, I think it, it, it kind of tracks because you can see similar issues happening. And they also seem to be disproportionately affecting people in the South of America as well, um, which tend to have higher um density uh bame populations so i think you can see there's definitely something tracking here and it tends to be that these people have been uh you know are less well off economically as you say and they've been often the tend to live you know m more people together or in, in those kind of communities where, where where people are more likely to bump into each other and all of that is not helpful in this current situation um but yeah it's it's mostly showing up all of these issues with inequality um and unfortunately, that's that's the case here, as over here as it is in the US. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you look over there, you can see a compar yeah, comparable numbers. Yeah, fingers crossed that you know something like this can help bring this to light and make society more equal. But I guess only only time will tell on that matter. Um, yeah, yeah. So Boris mentioned those two workers. Um, he also mentioned how like serious this was, and and people focused on his his quote saying that things could have gone either way. What this did do is that meant that when he'd actually recovered and came out of hospital, um, he stayed on the sideline away from frontline politics for uh, quite some time. In fact, he only returned uh, yesterday briefly to have a conversation with the Queen and a conversation with President Trump. I don't know in what order. Um, I assume the Queen is more, imp more important than President Trump. Um, but it was the first conversation he'd had with the Queen in over three weeks. Um, and over that time, we've seen um, maybe a little bit of a power vacuum within number 10. You know, Boris is away and he's left it, you know, it left the country in the hands of Dominic Raab. Um, but there may be some feeling that Raab wasn't possibly willing to take, you know, big, big decisions 
at a time when the prime minister was, you know, uh, unable to work, um, but still able, you know, knew that he was coming back at any time. Um, and we've seen a, you know, a a cast of characters um, appearing on our daily briefings, um, including uh, Ra, Matt Hancock, the health secretary, and Pretty Patel, who you can thank for our joke at the start. Um, when saying about the number of testing numbers, I think she said she misread a figure um, and gave a number that doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> but <Yeah>. I was <laughs> very happy she did for so much me- needed uh, mirth um, during this time. I, I, I think we're probably going to come back to this later on because we're kind of doing this chronologically. But mm-hmm. uh, today was also the first uh, remote PMQs, uh, which means we had Raab up against Sir Keir Starmer, um, who we mentioned in our last episode, is now the new leader of the Labour Party. So, yeah, I, I think I think we'll touch on that more later. But there's definitely, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not sure Raab is someone who inspires me with confidence. I mean. I, I think Boris did a very good code switch when suddenly he had to be um, talking about uh, the current situation, the pandemic. But uh, Rob still seems like Rob. And remember, this is the man who once said, I hadn't realised we were quite so reliant on the Dover-Calais crossing. Um, and I don't think we should let him live that down, if I'm honest. <laughs> no, <laughs> that should be... You know how like we say the disgraced um, Liam Fox... Um, before Disgrace everything, former defense secretary Liam Fox. Yeah. Yes, I reckon that should be the, the prefix to any time we mention Dominic Rob. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> quite so right and Kelly. So, so on the topic of Boris, uh, there's been this bit of a power vacuum, but there's also been some discussion uh, about how he initially handled uh, the crisis. Not, not, not what we've seen uh, as the public kind of you know the, the various press conferences, but when before things had really started to kick off that maybe he wasn't taking uh, everything as seriously as he should have done. Yeah, so what you've seen over, I think over time you've seen in this crisis, that a media tone shift. So when we went into lockdown, there is this rally around the flag effect. We're all, you know, one people, we must listen to the government. This is what we do in quite a united front. But as it's stretched on and we've seen the, you know, we've seen the implications of what's happened and, you know, we can target our progress against uh, other countries. Some people can say, okay, well, why is the UK tracking the same as Italy or Spain when we had two more weeks than them to prepare for this, you know, to happen. Why why didn't we act sooner? And so people have had look look back and in particular they've looked at the month of um February as maybe a missed opportunity month. What was happening there? What else could have we done to um to stop the effects being as large as they have? Um one of the more attention grabbing um things that appeared in this Sunday Times article, which we'll leave a link for in the show notes. Uh, it is behind a paywall, uh, which was the uh, subject of much discussion uh, on Twitter um, about um, should something of this important be kept behind a paywall? Should dual journalism be free? Blah, blah, blah. Um, so if you look on Twitter yourself, I haven't been able to find the link myself. I think Owen Jones has got a lot of um, clips from the article itself that help you get past that paywall. Uh, but anyway... Um, one of the big claims from that was that Boris didn't attend five COBRA meetings um, during the month of February in which the Prime Minister could have taken a, you know, a decisive stance and taken decisions that you know, would have led us to be better prepared. Uh, this led to Michael Gove going on the Sunday, uh, going on the, you know, the Sunday news shows after this article was presented saying, he said to Sky, no, Boris Johnson appeared in every COBRA meeting before going on the Andrew Marr show later to say that, ah, no, he did actually miss five. Yeah, so Gove um, tries to get to Boris's defence, saying that, you know, oh, he did attend those five Cobra meetings, and then a later interview with Andrew Marr said, ah, you know, he didn't, but prime ministers don't have to. And Gove is right there. Um, if you have a look at, like, the rules of Cobra, there's, there's nothing in there saying that the prime minister has to lead them. Uh, however, when you compare his response to prime ministers of the past, uh, for example, uh, Gordon Brown back in 2007, uh, when there was a foot and mouth crisis, personally chaired the Cobra meetings right at the start. You know, he wasn't just involved or a man on the side. He he led, you know, you can, and it's true that all prime ministers have a different leadership style. And maybe that talks to more of Gordon Brown's style of micromanaging than it does Boris Johnson, who seems fairly laissez-faire. Uh, but it is at a time of extreme national crisis and something that's had 
such a big impact on the country to have a prime minister who couldn't be bothered to turn up um or you know who was away for a large part of february um with his you know newly pregnant girlfriend uh it's a bad look for the prime minister and doesn't seem like he's taken you know he's taking this crisis on the front foot so i think when they're talking about the cobra meetings and him not being there that's the main criticism led against boris johnson and are we surprised did we expect a go getting you know is, does boris come across as a gordon brown style leader no he's always been a bit more like i said laissez faire he's always been a bit more lax in that department uh, but it certainly doesn't help his cause at the moment uh, i know you had a point to add what would you like to uh, what would you like to add i mean this is this is kind of a random aside but uh, i thought listeners especially non british listeners might find interesting as a physicist, I'm a big fan of uh, backronyms. Uh, I mean, you only have to look to stuff at CERN to see how many great backronyms physicists can come up with. Um, but I like the fact that COBRA stands for Cabinet Office Briefing Room A, <laughs> which is just excellent. Uh, I just proved they just were like, what should we call this? Oh, well, it turns out if we just name it after the room we hold it in, it's actually quite a cool name. Uh, <laughs> I wanted. <laughs> We like we were so close. If there's a, like a lesser crisis, is it Corb? Cobra. <laughs> Cobra. 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 Yeah, that's just, that's yeah. a really lame crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and Cobrook for for even worse crises. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> they obviously haven't thought through the various levels of crises. They're like we only have really bad crises. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we can't use the other rooms, guys. It's going to sound ridiculous. Um. <laughs> Sorry, that, that was a complete aside. I just thought it was <laughs> no, interesting. No, no, a welcome yeah. aside. Um, the second issue that's um, been rumbling on since the start is the issue of PPE or personal protective equipment um, and the availability to NHS staff. Uh, one of the other big revelations that came out of this Sunday Times article was that instead of choosing to stockpile PPE for um, what was likely to be an inevitable uh, pandemic, uh, the UK government decided to ship uh, remaining stock to China um, to help out with the crisis that was happening over there. Uh, this decision, you know, certainly seems odd and maybe seems a little short-sighted given, you know, it, it's you know, with the benefit of hindsight, it certainly does seem like a ridiculous decision now. Um, but questions over why that decision was taken in the short term probably do need to be answered uh, once this crisis is over. Um, in fact, a shipment of PPE that was promised on Sunday was delayed. Um, it was meant to be coming from Turkey. It's been delayed several times. I believe that it was only able to come in today. Um, and there have been various um, criticisms from uh, like NHS bosses and ones that have hit the front, the front pages, essentially saying, we don't have appropriate PPE for this crisis. I think one of the big comparisons that's been made is, you know, you could make sandwiches at a local deli in this, but it's not going to actually do anything to protect you. Um, and it's led to some, you know, doctors and nurses saying that they're going into work knowing they're not properly protected, but they've still got to do their job. Um, and particularly when you want to be, you know, one of the big driving factors for this government has to be to protect your frontline NHS workers because they're the people who are going to get you through this and they're going to make sure that, you know, you want your intensive care units filled with qualified doctors, not having doctors who are having to go off sick and being out um for 14 days every time so yeah uh there's a lot of that criticism coming through as well and it's been highlighted they've been one of the you know permanent questions that have come up in the daily briefings uh finally i think the other big fact it wasn't really touched on in the article but the only other thing that i can think of that's really been a big issue is uh testing uh there's been a lot of controversy about test sites that were set up at the start um, that are practically empty and unused. Uh, the government is struggling to get the amount of testing kits in they need. Um, I believe at the most recent briefing, they said that they would aim for a 100,000 tests by the end of this week. Uh, but testing is going to be vital for the next stage um, that we're about to enter in. Uh, if lockdown comes to an end, what you will need to do, um, what's been a successful strategy in places such as South Korea and Germany, is this uh, test trace mentality of you need to make sure that everybody who's going out into the workplace is tested. Those who are positive, you then trace back to where they are and isolate those people. And then you can keep your curve much flatter, and much smaller. If you're not testing people, the big problem we've got at the moment is 
if we end lockdown, we don't know what percentage of the population has been infected. If it's five percent, then going coming out of it will be, you know, it won't be very good because you won't have ninety five percent of people won't have had any form of immunity to it. If it's fifty percent, then hey, we're starting to get to a a slightly better scenario. One one thing I've I've posted related to that um, that I'll throw in the show notes. So uh, the Financial Times have done an estimate. So, uh, like the, the it, what is an important number to track is is interesting. So all of the official statistics that are being released are due to deaths in hospitals that are directly linked, and so that means someone has to have been in hospital and then been tested. Now, obviously, they're trying to test everyone in hospital, but if there's a shortage of tests, then someone might not be tested. And they might have to, you know, you know, you're not sure if that person then had it. Um, but the other problem is, of course. There's been an uptick in deaths, um, so, so you can see the registered number of deaths in the community that haven't necessarily gone to hospital, um, and so therefore wouldn't be tracked in the official number that's being put out. Um, so it's an interesting article. Have a look into it, but essentially suggesting that maybe the actual figure is double what the official figures say, because it's all about these community deaths. You know, people who you might normally have thought had died of natural causes, but with that, with a test, you might be able to find out actually it was caused by the virus. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big thing. I think that's happening like in most places over the world, you know, across the, across the globe. Um, official tracking is slightly behind the actual number affected. Uh, and there's a big lag on those results. We're even seeing numbers updated in, in China, aren't we, at the moment, for people saying, oh, actually, it's a bit... I. I- I will f- make a screenshot of this that I can link. I-, I mean, I'll link to this. This is a really good visualization website um, that shows the various curves for all the different countries. Um, and they actually have a button to toggle China because China was dealing with this so early on. If you click um, on the average uh, daily deaths uh, one, uh, which is obviously a bit morbid, you can see that China is this gray line that kind of goes down. And it's nearly down to where South Korea is. If you toggle China now, you can see that about day 79, there's this sudden spike because that gets reported. That, which I will throw into the show notes. Oh, cool. And it's quite stark how suddenly that jumps up to be higher than Iran on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, China's big. So yeah. any number from China will be big and bias things. But given that they were leading everyone to believe that everything was fine, that sudden uptick uh, suggests uh, some problems. It, with reporting, at least, if not yes. you know, control of the control of the disease. The, the, the problem is we're not there on the ground. We can only guess what that means uh, at the moment. I think, but obviously, people are saying, "Oh, well, was the government hiding figures, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Um, but yeah, you don't want to suddenly be back to that kind of level if you've told everyone everything's safe. Everyone goes back out. So that's why uh, the the kind of strategy is being suggested. And I happen to know some people who've been involved in some of these things who've. who've mention stuff informally as much as they can but it does seem like the progress of this it's a it's going to be more for the long haul than i think people are expecting and it will probably be a mixture of these measures of lockdown release lockdown release where release is not necessarily back to what we would consider normality it may be stuff like allowing people back to schools so the schools are technically open but again there's still gonna be all these restrictions for more vulnerable people and, and so on and so forth um because you can uh, I can't remember the name of the psychological effect right now, but there is an effect whereby basically if people keep living under a set of stringent rules, they start to go, oh, I don't really like following these rules. They start to get um, tired of, of it, basically. So th- there's a bit where everyone kind of comes together, like you say, that rally around the flag effect. And we're all kind of like, yes, we'll do this for, for king and country and all that kind of stuff. But after a while, everyone starts to get a bit tired of it. So there's the idea being that from a psychological point of view, you can take take the foot off the pedal a bit of the isolation, allow people out and about, maybe go, maybe reopen pubs a little bit, something like that, um, that allows people to kind of be like, oh, things are a bit back to normal. But then you have to pay attention to how the rates are being affected and then you might have to come back in with more severe lockdown uh, again. So, yeah, we just don't know what it's going to be like at this stage. And yeah, it's it's hard to guess where we'll be in, in a month's time, etc. Everybody's, yeah. In that same boat there. Uh, talking about things that are hard to guess, um, Brexit. Oh, yes. Uh, I've seen, I think the only headline I've seen about Brexit is basically 
everyone's saying, oh, well, if we get offered an extension, we're going to ignore it. Even though the idea behind us being offered an extension right now is because coronavirus has somewhat taken over everything. Yeah, I think it will be odd if the government refuses that extension because I believe the mood in the country right now is not a we're trying to delay or there's no feeling that to delay Brexit would be to stop it. Um, You know, before the 2019 election, there was, you know, I think conservatives could rightly say that, oh, if there is a delay, you know, Labour will use it as an excuse to get a second referendum. Or, you know, if you vote, you know, if the Lib Dems get in, they will overturn the decision altogether. There's no party in Parliament that's willing to say that they're going to overturn the referendum result now. Um, or offer us a chance to. So I would say that accepting the extent, the extension would be a good idea, particularly as you probably want to have everything economically fine, given the mass. Well, you want to have the you want to have your economic stability of being in the European Union, be able to trade for a little bit longer whilst your economy tries to recover from the effects of COVID. So there's all that to be, you know to go on. Um, however, there's Another controversy that's sort of happened involving the UK and the EU, um, which surrounds you know the issue of PPE, uh, there's been a lot of discussion as if the UK's decision not to join in with a EU scheme to bulk buy a lot of PPE was due to a high level political decision, which was basically no, we've left the European Union, we don't want your help, we'll do this alone. Um, or was it due to sort of administrative errors? We've heard from the government that, um, you know, there were, uh, they missed the email was one of the uh, things that they said, um, you know. And if you have a look at the timeline of events, um, which maybe you can drop that in the show notes as well, The Guardian has provided a very good timeline of events. Um, it basically brings it through from the 31st of January 2020, where the UK has, you know, by all means officially left the EU. Um, the EU, the EU starts to meet up and says that, you know, we're going to need PPE soon. They don't include the UK in those discussions. EU, and on the 4th of Feb, EU countries share observations on the state of supplies of PPE in a meeting from member states of the World Health Organization. The UK was there. The UK was invited on the 24th of February to join a meeting to this, but no UK representative attended. Um, so the EU launched its first scheme on the 28th of Feb. The UK is not involved, but um, because of you know the lack of suitable suppliers on the 12th of March, they relaunch that scheme. The UK is still not involved. The 17th of March, they launch another one. The UK is still not involved. And then on the 19th of March, the UK belatedly takes up an invitation to join the Joint Procurement Agreement um, Steering Committee, uh, which makes a decision on the mass, pur- mass purchases. Um, but basically they don't get involved. The reason if they get involved or not is all this, you know, a big subject of debate. Uh, And the worry is that, you know, did the UK government take a decision that was based on, ah, we'll go it alone because we're, you know, we're the UK, we'll be fine. Or, you know, even worse, we've left the EU, we don't want anything to do with you. When in fact, that could have saved lives. You know, if it could have saved lives, then yeah, sure, why not go for it? I don't think anybody voted to leave the EU so that they couldn't be involved in buying PPE when it was needed at one of the you know the greatest health crises, health crises we've known in the past one hundred years. Um, it seems bizarre, and this is something that hasn't really gone away. It was discussed at the end of March, and then well, kind of went away when Boris went into hospital, but now it's coming up again. And I think that, you know, particularly Matt Hancock, and I know a couple of, uh, a civil servant said that it was a political decision yesterday, and then five hours later immediately withdrew that um, as a claim, uh, saying that he had misspoken. Uh, so who's pulling the strings on that uh, is unknown at the moment, but it's it shows what a mess, um, you know, we've always talked about Brexit and the challenges it brings um and maybe sometimes you know people were some people were saying that they were willing to take the economic hit you know in order Mm. to get brexit done um this is something where i would say it's not worth taking the hit on when it comes down to people's lives it seems like a bizarre decision to make particularly if it was 
Yeah, and unfortunately, I think it's one of those things where it's not going to be until everything washes out uh, at the other end that we know one way or the other what actually happened. As you say, there's there's already been someone saying something has been retracted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I suppose it's a thing we'll find in the uh, fullness of time. But yeah, if if that was the decision, it seems awfully short-sighted uh, and foolish. I just want to give a, a bit of a live news update again. Um, while we've been recording, um, uh, you know, we have these daily uh, conferences now. Um, Professor Chris Whitty, who's our the government's chief medical advisor, has uh, said that essentially some of the disruptive lockdown measures are set to remain in force for the rest of the year. So that kind of answers that um, that question we were asking uh, only about five minutes ago. So social distancing kind of measures will likely have to be in effect um, for the rest of the year. And also they've updated saying that that contract tracing system uh, will also should be in place in a matter of weeks, that system you mentioned. So that's kind of where we are right now. And uh, there's only so much I can say because the news is changing all the time. But I mean, a year is is a fairly long time. And I think a lot of people are hoping this to be over and done within a few months. So uh, prepare for the long haul. Maybe do start taking that daily exercise you're supposed to, <laughs> as opposed to hoping it will blow all over a bit yeah. like Christmas after a month. Um, so our next point I think you had was uh, one I alluded to earlier. So Parliament is back, but in uh, a remote uh, social distancing form via Zoom. So ha- how how was that going? How how were PMQs today with uh, Keir Starmer, which was also over Zoom? Yeah, it was... A bizarre experience and particularly sort of focusing on Kia for a moment. Um, a lot of leaders of the opposition are valued on their performance in Prime Minister's questions. It's, you know, the only chance they get to scrutinize the government. And, you know, if you're able to do that effectively, really judges if you've got an opposition or not. The, all the usual things that we'd use for point scoring, such as the noise in the chamber and the jeering that you get, just didn't apply today. Um, and also the the subject matter, um, Kia had to tread a very fine line. Um, as we've said, it's probably this rally round the flag effect. This, you know, when this first broke, the Labour Party said, "No, we respect everything that the government is is doing. We're behind all these measures. We're not going to oppose them." Now he has to act as a opposition, giving justified criticism to a response but not appear to undermine any of the you know the, the good things that the government is trying to do to ensure that the virus doesn't spread so this pmqs was very fact based there were a lot of fact and figures and i think kia particularly picked up on the the element of testing and saying that testing should happen faster um rather than some of the more emotional speeches that we've seen in pmqs before or one of those where they try to go for a a real zinger or or a quip to make sure that they you know you get that five second clip that makes it onto the news and we mentioned last time that Keir being a detail oriented uh human rights lawyer as a person that's the kind of thing that would stand up well we would expect against boris's kind of more as you say um emotional kind of like but boris boris is very good at standing up and talking to a room of people but the way to take that down in response is to be like well you've said this and it's wrong they're like and, and did we see that? Fact? I appreciate it wasn't Boris take, who he was uh, asking questions of today, but uh, did that come across as we expected? I think in a way, yes, but it is hard because he's up against Rob, who isn't Boris, who will who is also having to take quite a... In the same way that Kia couldn't do the same jeering insults that maybe he would do to Boris under normal circumstances, Rob wasn't flinging it back either. You know, there was none of this fire or, or, you you know, you can get some real fiery PMQs. If you think to, you know, what was happening uh, when we were in stalemate over Brexit, some of those PMQs were vicious. Um, And some of the debates were really... Corbyn versus Theresa May. Uh, Yeah, and even even, uh, like Corbyn versus Boris when we had like the votes of no confidence and, you know, zombie parliament, all of that. That was was an ill-tempered House of Commons... uh, now everybody is, you know, the situation demands a much more tempered response from from all sides. So I think it is really difficult to judge Kia on, you know, any traditional standards that we usually would do. All I can say is that he came across as competent, 
again, which is all, all you really need at this time. And his questioning was precise and fact-based, which is all you can really do at the moment. Um, if you want an example of somebody not doing that at the moment, then I'll point you across the pond to President Trump, whose press briefings have been... Whoa. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think I threw in a link sometime during the week in the chat, uh, which was uh, someone. I, I, I think this is someone. Uh, like, I, 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 I can't tell. I'm not based in the US. I, I I'm not a hundred percent sure if this is correct, but it was a CNN uh, writer has had it, and it's like angry Trump turns briefing into propaganda session. But I think we'll get to that when we talk about the polls update over in the US about Trump's approval ratings. Um, before we do that, we will throw in a small advert here for one of the other shows on the network. Good evening and welcome to the bar. Join Dr. Wilco as he investigates the histories of your favorite spirits and your favorite cocktails while mixing you a drink at the bar. The other bars may be closed, but a podcast bar will always remain open. So now I think we can move on to our quick polls update. And again, we're focusing on the US. Uh, there's not going to be a general election over here for some time. So we're focusing on Trump's approval ratings and, and how he will fare against Joe Biden, who uh, I think I managed to edit it together OK last week. Um, but uh, between recording and release, Biden became the uh, Democratic nominee because Sanders stepped down. Let's have a look at those polls from 538.com. So so the, the, the generic ballot, uh, which is just Democrat versus Republican, it's if you look at that, it only loads like the last week's worth of polls um, by default, and it's strongly pro-Democrat. Um, the best is a plus 12, though that's from a, a dubious quality study, you know, down to grade C or D. Um, but even like the YouGov polls and the other um, more reliable polls are in the kind of five to eight range. Uh, let's just put it down to like really good pollsters. Uh, even if you go to like a and B pollsters uh, all the way back to December 17th. Um, that's It's just all looking towards Democrat. So it definitely thinks, it definitely seems like the, the response, uh, which may be unprecedented and all of that, doesn't seem to have helped the Republicans at all. Uh, no, not at all. Um, although bizarrely, Democratic governors are the ones most under attack at the moment or at least have the most visible protests against them i don't know if you've seen a lot of these but these these people who are protesting in cars or meeting in thousands to protest lockdown measures uh i think it was it was one of the governors i can't remember which state so apologies for this um but she basically did the response of i know these people want lockdown to end however their actions may have actually extended lockdown because you have a thousand people there who all met up not wearing any protective gear um, and then all went home again. Uh, this is exactly the sort of thing that we are trying to prevent. So, yeah, it's bizarre. Um, given that Trump also tweeted um, like a series of three tweets saying liberate three particular states all run by Democratic governors in what was a kind of a a weird undermining of, you know, he's at a federal level, he's telling everybody to lock down. And then at a state by state level, He's saying, oh, but you should definitely protest these three Democratic governors for locking you down. It's bizarre. So, I mean, we're a bit late to the story on this one, but that was covered, I think, by John Oliver very extensively on the latest episode of Last Week Tonight. And, I mean, yeah, it's so bizarre. That's like if Boris Johnson turned around and said, oh, you know, uh, we've got all this lockdown in place, but you should go and charge around Surrey making an annoyance. Or something. It's so weird. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know we don't have the same. I suppose maybe a better, maybe a better. Um, <laughs> I, I pick Surrey because I live in Surrey. It's easy to think of, but, but maybe a better thing is like if he said, "Oh, Scotland, you know, go go out and about, uh, even though everyone else is in lockdown," would probably be better. But still, or like it makes no sense. Manchester or London, like a, a Labour heartland somewhere like that. I'll go and go out in the streets of Liverpool and protest it. You know. It, it, you're going into areas that have always voted Democrat, whatever, always voted that, and trying to undermine their authority when you're saying exactly the same thing. It's, yeah, it's weird. Very strange. Uh, one comment is just kind of, it's from a Facebook post I saw earlier, so it's like a very glib comment, but um, the people who seem to be protesting are those ones who are all in like the combat vests. They, 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 they look mm. like preppers. Yeah. All these people who seem to be prepared for the nuclear apocalypse go mad if they can't go to the Cheesecake Factory. And it just, 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I've I've seen a post along those lines. Yes. Um, it's like <laughs> I'm I, I can survive for years like this. You know, picture of small room, and it's like day day four of quarantine. I need to get a haircut. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure people will have seen many memes going around. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So coming out of that, then we come over to Donald Trump's popularity as a, as a as a president, separate from how people are what party they're indicating they may vote for. And I think the, the story we've generally told, except for at the very start, is that Trump has generally had a higher disapproval rating than approval rating, and it's generally been over 50% disapproval. Although, to be fair to him, that's not necessarily unusual for presidents. I think, like, for a fair period of Obama's term, he was actually had a higher disapproval rating than we would expect based on what we see in the media. All that being said, Trump has been consistently over 50% disapproval rating uh, since February 2017. He's been consistently up there. And then, end of March, he started doing stuff to do the pandemic, and he briefly dips down to 49.7% disapproval. There's a little blip at the end of the graph before jumping back up to what I think is it's slightly below, below average for him, but 52.3% disapproval at the moment. Um, and only 43% of people are proving. So, yeah, I mean, he's kind of returned to normality. And I think that's probably because people, uh, probably an effect of that rally around the flag effect. As you say, Trump, Trump brought in some, some measures. There, there was talk of, you know, suddenly giving out uh, unemployment benefits and things like that. And then a few weeks later, here we are and things are not working as well as they should. There's been all these problems with the uh, unemployment system over in the US because it's been overwhelmed um, uh, again. Look at John Oliver's video of uh, that clip. I think it was from NBC News. Don't quote me on which news ch- channel it was from. But this woman who just kept ringing up trying to get her unemployment benefit and couldn't get through because the system was absolutely swamped. So I think the reality of uh, the reality is kind of biting Trump here, and things are back to to normal from Trump's approval rating point of view. And the way he's handling it is it, he's playing the blame game. It's everybody else's fault apart from his, isn't it? It's China's fault. It's the WHO's fault. He said that he would, you know, stop funding um, the World Health Organization, uh, which seems a bizarre decision in a time where you would need them most to withhold funding. Um, And the US makes up quite a large proportion of their actual funding budget. Uh, I think Bill Gates was one of the most more prominent people to come out against that decision. Um, Bill Bill Gates, uh, a side fact there, I believe Bill Gates is the fourth biggest contributor to the World Health Organization. Like, so it's like the US, two other, I think it's like the US, China, someone else, and him, uh, proving that Bill Gates' wealth is equivalent to a country. I mean, it's being used for good. Don't get me wrong, but that's kind of amazing. Yeah, no, I will say, yeah, on, on like a Bill Gates side note, I guess he seems to be, a lot of people have like questioned the action of billionaires during this time, you know, like Jeff Bezos, what he's doing, you know, what's he doing? He's just keeping Amazon running and, and nothing else. Um, Bill Gates has always been like a big contributor to health projects. I know that he was, you know, doing lots of uh, anti-malaria, anti-malaria stuff um, before all of this happened. And when it came to getting a vaccine for COVID-19, um, I know that Bill Gates was quoted as saying like, uh, we need four factories and we'll, like there'll be four solutions and it's likely that three of those won't be viable by the time that they get to that stage. Um, but we don't have the time to wait and see which one's viable and then build a factory. So we'll just build four factories now and then shut them down. It's like that action of you can't just throw money at this problem to make it go away, but money sure as hell helps a lot. Um, and to have someone like Bill Gates making actions like that to try and make the process as smooth as possible um, yeah, he's he's doing a lot of good stuff. Um, but yeah, but back to Trump. Uh, essentially, his his approval rating dip and then spike. Uh, I think I heard Nate Silver saying it was one of like the uh, shortest rally around the flag effects he'd ever seen um, yeah. in presidential. You know, he, it's he about really, a week. <laughs> yeah, he, he had some good feeling there, or people thought about it, and then he's been able to turn that on its head. And I think it's the the daily press conferences, the daily things from him don't seem to help they don't inspire confidence from what i've seen um and as you say like the, you know they're attacking the world health organization and things like that like 
uh, uh, Twitter sends me a notification every time the White House is live, apparently, uh, which I don't get for the for the BBC. So I, I probably follow the the UK ones maybe every two days. But uh, yeah, the the kind of it's Trumpian grandstanding. Um, he's he's kind of almost turning them into his own rallies. But the problem is that everyone's seeing them, not just the people who agree with him. Yeah, and his his latest one, I think, was to say that you know uh, an immigration bill mm. uh, that came in, just saying, oh, we're going to stop all immigration for. We've had a bit more detail on that for sixty days, and that will affect people who are applying for citizenship. But this time, it's a he, he's trying. He's playing all the greatest hits now, isn't he? Of the Trump campaign. Uh, oh, I'll go after immigrants, even though in reality it has very little to do with the current crisis. I mean, borders tend to be closed at the moment, anyway, or you know, largely. Um, freedom of movement is you know stopped in you know in the EU temporarily, but when Trump does it, it seems to have a bit more of a a bite about it and he's playing the old you know the same political tune trying to speak to his base damn the consequences for the rest of everyone so yeah a uh a disturbing scene over in america but i think it's it's one of the things that's keeping me going you know like as much as you can criticize the uk's response in some ways you can have a look over at you know the usa and brazil and think well at least at least we're not those guys um brazil is another matter i don't know if john oliver or anybody has touched on what's happening in brazil with their president I'd heard some stuff, but I, I must say I haven't really been following it. Um, if you want to fill us in here, we can leave it in here. That's fine. Yeah, like super short. Um, he's a Trump-esque uh, character. Bolsonaro? I, I try Bolsonaro? To Bolsonaro, yeah. Bolsonaro is, is him. And he's been quoted as saying that it's just like, it's just the sniffles. It's just a, it's a, a minor flu. It'll go away. And he essentially refused to put the country into lockdown, saying that Brazil has a climate and a young population will be fine. Um, and the complete lack of action and his frequent undermining of health officials trying to give advice mean that they think Brazil might be one of the countries that comes out of this the worst or with one of the biggest spikes, um, even though reporting over there is maybe less uh, accurate than we would expect, or, you know, because of just the development of the country, it's harder to track those things in Brazil. Um, its curve is certainly seeing the effects of having no action taken. So, uh, yeah, scary times for those in Brazil. Um, and then you've got America, which is also like one of like the biggest affected country in the world now with somebody at its helm who doesn't seem to be handling it very well. Uh, I can't remember if I said this last time, uh, but the one consolation I have is that he must be miserable right now, Trump. He's having to do work every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, before we head on into our uh, outro, um, I, I'm not sure if this will stay in here. It could maybe be a Patreon bonus thing, or I will just cut it out and release it as like a bonus thing. I don't know. Um, or maybe I'll just leave this in. But I thought maybe, maybe uh, given that we're talking about a lot of uh, depressing topics right now, uh, I know we've tried to add a little bit of levity here and there, but I wondered if you had any recommendations. What is it you're watching in lockdown uh, that is taking your mind off things? Um it's not it's not new to anybody probably uh, but i've just discovered it um it's on the bbc uh, bbc i play have you seen any of this country which is no i haven't actually uh a comedy set in the cotswolds following uh two uh younger people kerry and curtin uh and what life is like for them in a deprived cotswold village it's hilarious it's heartbreaking in places and it just reminds me of, particularly because it's all West Country accents and stuff, I, I know kids who I went to school who are like that, who are probably yeah. having the same lives as that. And it's, it's very, very funny. Uh, if you get a chance, yeah, give, give it a go. I believe it is uh, at least BAFTA award-winning comedy. It's, you know, it's, it's no Mrs. Brown's voice. Oh, I, I've not heard of that, but I'll definitely have to check it out because uh, I think comedy is a thing I've been turning to. Um, not quite uh, well definitely not comedy but uh, another thing which i'm sure you haven't been able to live on the internet without hearing about uh I, and i suppose my recommendations are more netflixy because i'm assuming more people have access to that than the bbc because i know we have listeners who are outside of the uk um so firstly tiger king it is okay, okay. My, my my comment on this is that everybody has a go at carol baskin and yeah she's weird and maybe she killed her husband but the worst person on that is Doc Antle. Doc Antle is a scumbag. Oh, yeah. He, he's definitely, yeah. It's definitely like 
uh, it's it's a really interesting documentary in that over seven episodes you're introduced to several characters who are out there and weird and it's very kind of florida man they're all horrible people how do they get that's the thing like yeah they they build everyone up a bit and they're like oh well this person is you know famous for this or that they've been on this tv show and they're like okay and you know they've helped out with filming stuff in his specific case and then like the next episode the rug is pulled out from under you because it's like and this person's awful because of this and there's all these accusations about this and it's just a well-constructed documentary and the fact that the 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 topic matter is is somehow real it it, it's it's a fascinating watch and it's only like six hours i think total so yeah uh, obviously i think everyone is suggesting that right now but i finally watched it and i enjoyed it Something you reminded me of, having talked about Bill Gates earlier, there's a documentary which I'll, I'll, I'll link called um, Inside Bill's Brain, which is from 2019, but basically it's they're hanging out with Bill Gates and you see how he makes decisions. And it's one of those things where it's really interesting given the current situation, because this is a person with a lot of money who is trying to help. But, but you know, he has to make those hard decisions of because if he just gave away a small portion of his money to everyone in the world, sure, everyone in the world would be a small bit richer. But it's like, well, how do I focus this on research? And, how, you know, where where he puts his money is important because it's funding all these different initiatives. And it's it's kind of about his decision making process and stuff like that. Um, it's obviously not specifically related to the current pandemic, but it's it's just kind of a fascinating thing, especially for someone who, you know, in the mid 90s, everyone was like, oh, well, Bill Gates, he's the man behind that evil paperclip. He's really rich. Like he was the Jeff... Maybe he wasn't the Jeff Bezos of his time, but I think people would have probably said stuff about Bill Gates like that then. And I think he spent a lot of his later years doing very good work with the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So it's interesting to watch how someone like that works. Yeah, definitely. And if you don't have a Netflix subscription or don't have access uh, to the BBC, I think there's a load of free stuff uh, available on various websites. I know... Amazon via Audible have released a load of free audiobooks. Uh, there's a load of free kids TV available uh, on Prime Video, I think, for streaming now. Um, oh, and if you do have a BBC account, uh, BBC Sounds have released a load of audiobooks for free, including their full cast production of uh, The Testaments, which is the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, which only recently came out. So it's not just like, you know, old period drama kind of stuff. There's There's modern books that they've done productions of. And you can get for free, depending on where you live. It's not just stuff in the public domain, is it? I guess it's... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So uh, I think that's it. it's a BBC Sounds uh, uh, thing. So you have to have an account. And it's not as open as podcasting, unfortunately, which is my one criticism of BBC Sounds, because there used to be a period where all the BBC stuff was basically free for everyone. And I thought that was great. This is not my time to soapbox about whether BBC stuff should be open and available to everyone, but... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of cool free stuff out there. There's been people giving away free RPGs uh, all over the place. I know that Onyx Path were giving out um, all of the 20th anniversary versions of uh, World of Darkness. They were doing them like one day after the other, so you, you will have probably missed out on that. But there's so much free stuff out there at the moment and so much um, like stuff like Humble Bundles where you can pay whatever you want, but the do- proceeds are going to charities helping people directly affected. Uh, there's a lot out there, which is what I'm saying, uh, of stuff that is interesting and, and fun and free or costs very little, but the proceeds go towards helping people. So if you are starting to go around the bend stuck at home, uh, then, you know, there, there's a lot of things to distract yourself with and hopefully take your mind off the situation. As always, Rob, uh, thank you for joining me and lending your insights. Uh, uh, it, it's it's nice to have a conversation as well. Uh, nice to touch base with your friends and check everyone's okay so that's good as well it's been nice having a a scheduled call amongst all this um (laughs) as always you can find us on our website parliamentary.observer uh you can find us uh, everywhere podcasts are found uh and on youtube and all sorts of other places uh if you want to support us financially uh patreon.com forward slash ttss where there are some patreon only posts going up and they found out about my new podcast a day before anyone else there's there's things like that if that entices you uh throw a few dollars our way to support the website and the equipment we need and uh yeah as always uh, the best thing you can do is like spread the word about the podcast tell other people that you like us why you like us uh, get them to download and listen to it maybe say oh there's this someone reading journey to the center of the earth uh, over on this podcast uh, and send them to uh audio folio so whatever it is uh, any support is obviously welcome 
but you know if if at the moment you can give uh money to 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 a more worthy cause than us uh, i'd also recommend that um we are both currently employed so i think if if you can support charity instead of us i i completely understand and do do that other than that i don't think there's anything else to say than it's good night from me and it's a uh, good night from him bye 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 bye, bye. Join Mike and Tom for a nerdy conversation with a multitude of guests on the Hat of Many Things. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hello. I'm Mark, a librarian and professional wrestling ring announcer. And I cast League of Legends. I'm Sadaros Phil Brucato, best known for my work with uh, White Wolf and uh, Onyx Path Publishing on the World of Darkness. Uh, hi, I'm Jason Carl. I'm uh, the producer of V5 at uh, White Wolf. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Johanna Pettersson, a Finnish game, game designer. Thank <laughs> you.